Hey up everyone. Today I'm going to explore the thrilling era of the 1960s and 70s, seeking out the adrenaline fueled world of the fastest 500cc motorcycles. There's a bit of background from the post-war period too. From iconic legends to hidden gems, join us and we will unveil some true champions and step into a past where speed was king and these bikes ruled the roads. We have looked at the 250cc motorcycles that broke the 100 mile an hour barrier in a previous video and today I'm going to look at the 500cc motorcycles that came before them. I hope at least some of them managed to surprise you and I'm sure you will tell me about the bikes I've missed. There is always at least one or two. As with the 250s, I've tried to stick to production motorcycles and out of the showroom speeds. But you have to remember, it was a very different world. I can't vouch for the accuracy of any factory quoted figures. And remember, there's always a trade-off between acceleration and top speed. There's an interesting article about understanding motorcycle gear ratios on the website and I'll link it in the description below for anyone that's interested. But stick around for now, there's plenty to come. Some of the motorcycles in the list were known more for their potential rather than for the standard power figures. Engine and chassis specialists popped up everywhere. People like Harry Weslake who invented the process of gas flowing heads and Colin Seeley, who built frames that were so much better than anything the large manufacturers were churning out, it was like they were from a different planet. I've been planning a video about some of these forgotten heroes of the motorcycle industry, but you can imagine that that's a long-term project. This one was a bit of a minefield, with contradictory information and exaggerated claims. I do think some of the manufacturer's claims were maybe fueled by the strength of the illicit substances available during that era. If you enjoy the video, it'd be great if you could hit the like button. It helps get the video out to people who don't know the channel yet. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, for a weekly dose of news, views and adventures from the motorcycle world. Now. To give the motorcycles of the 60s and 70s some context, I have to mention a few earlier bikes first. These were the benchmarks that had been set in the period after the Second World War. The first motorcycles were still being made in the 60s, but had been designed and first built in some cases long before then. The first bike I will mention is a legendary motorcycle and is also the oldest made by one of the companies with a long and successful racing history going right back to 1909. AJS was a family company named after Albert John Stevens. They had their first TT win in 1914, taking first, second, third, fourth and sixth places. That's even beyond the dominance Ducati have managed in the 2023 MotoGP World Championship and World Superbikes. With interruptions during both world wars, the company never had an easy life, but after the Second World War, they began work on an all-new motorcycle that was to be supercharged and entered into the World Championships. Unfortunately for AJS, the rules were changed to ban superchargers and the motorcycle had to be reworked to make it eligible to compete. The result was the AJS E90 Porcupine. This is the original horizontal twin designed where the engine had been laid flat so there was space of the supercharger above. The radical design was reworked to produce over 40 horsepower at 7,800 RPM in the early 1940s. Les Graham won the 1949 World Championship on an unsupercharged AJS E90 500 Porcupine. But for 1954, the bike was developed further, lowering the engine in the frame and raising the power to 48 horsepower. It immediately won the first two rounds of the World Championship and took first at the Isle of Man TT. The bike was clocked 
at 135 miles an hour. But putting that into perspective, it wasn't renowned for its acceleration. However, it holds the title of being the only twin-cylinder motorcycle to ever win the Isle of Man TT Senior Race. It still holds that honour to this day. These were motorcycles tuned for racing, so it wouldn't be fair to compare them to the other bikes on the list. But it will give you an idea how far ahead of the game AJS were when I talk about the other 500cc motorcycles of this post-war period and beyond. It didn't stop there either. By 1953, AJS were already reworking the Porcupine, and the original horizontally laid cylinders were moved to make a 45 degree angle parallel twin. This motorcycle was given the name the E95 Porcupine, and although very different, it used much of the technology that had made the original E90 so fast. The E95 was tested at 55 horsepower in 1953 but they were unreliable on track, and sadly, only four were ever made as far as I'm aware. Associated Motorcycles and the AGS name eventually ended up in the hands of Norton Villiers Group in 1966. The factory was turned over to making the then-new Villiers Starmaker engines, and AGS faded away from the racing world. I will also give a brief mention to the now legendary 5TA. It did only produce around 27 horsepower as standard, but it changed the focus of the British motorcycle industry going forward. Edward Turner will have seen the success of the AJS twins, but he would bring a cheap and powerful twin cylinder engine to the masses. The next motorcycles that need to be mentioned are the 1955 Veloset Venom and the 1956 Norton Dominator. These were both 500cc motorcycles that could not only break the 100 mile an hour mark, but hold that speed. The Velocet Venom was an expensive handmade 500cc single that produced around 34 horsepower and weighed around 175 kilos dry. It has the honor of being the first motorcycle to average over 100 miles an hour continuously for 24 hours. No 500cc single cylinder motorcycle has broken that record to this day as far as I'm aware. The Norton Dominator was an attempt to build a motorcycle that was better than the Triumph 5TA Speed Twin. Bert Hopwood had been on Edward Turner's design team at Triumph and when he moved to Norton a new twin was designed to try and win back some of the market the speed twin had taken from them. Later models would be increased to 650cc, but the first 500cc twins produced 31 horsepower and weighed around 180 kilos dry. They would easily hold speeds of 100 mile an hour. They were smoother and easier to start than the big singles, and along with the 5TA and the various BSA twins, they would set the path for the British motorcycle industry going forward. I have to mention BSA here too. They had been building the 500cc single cylinder BSA Gold Star since 1938. It was a proven winner, and by the 60s it was producing 48 horsepower and 38 newton meters of torque, and weighed around 172 kilos dry, giving it an incredible top speed of over 110 miles an hour. It continued in production until 1968. Built for speed alone, the 500cc single was notoriously hard to start and ran like a two-legged camel at low revs. But get it on the track and it was a different story. One last mention before we start the main list is for the matchless G85 CS. AJS had become part of the Associated Motorcycles Group and Matchless were their bread and butter brand. Matchless used the latest AJS engine in the G85CS, which was a thoroughbred scrambler. It was built in 1964 and produced 41 horsepower and 43 newton meters of torque and weighed in at just 145 kilos dry. If it had been geared for top speed, who knows how fast it would have gone, 
but it was geared low for competition scrambles, so top speed is not a fair way to judge it, but it does deserve a special mention here. Now we come to the 1960s and the start of the list proper, and it's another list that has to be done in date order for it to make any sense. Into the market I've described the book, in 1965, Honda released the CB450 Black Bomber. The CB72 250 Dream Twin had been a huge success, and Honda wanted some of the large capacity market dominated by the British twins and singles. The Black Bomber did compete on performance with many of the bigger bikes on the market. It produced 45 horsepower and 37 newton meters of torque, and weighed about 185 kilos dry. This gave it to top speed in excess of 103 miles an hour. The CB450 wasn't a cheap motorcycle though. The engine was a double overhead camshaft design and it had a 180 degree firing order. Both of these things made it appear new, different and exotic. But it wasn't the commercial success of the CB250. It just didn't offer any significant gains in performance over some of the motorcycles already established in the world markets. What it did do is make other manufacturers take notice of this company that was still newcomers on the world stage. Next, also in 1965, we have to revisit the Velocet Venom because we got the release of the Velocet Venom Thruxton the fastest incarnation of the Venom models. Power had been pushed up to 41 horsepower, but it was the 48 newton meters of torque that made this big single such a success. Weight was around 170 kilos dry, and geared for speed it was clocked at over 120 miles an hour, giving it a performance that wouldn't be equaled for years. It regularly outperformed bigger bikes, and was renowned for the beautiful build quality that made Velocet their name. But it was another expensive motorcycle, so was out of the reach of the average working man. It does also show that out and out top speed is not always the best way to compare motorcycles. Yes, the Venom Thruxton was a fast motorcycle. Outside of the AJS Porcupine, probably the fastest 500cc motorcycle of its day, However, that speed was achieved on a motorcycle geared for speed. That came at the cost of acceleration, despite the impressive torque figure. In the hands of a racer who could hold their speed through the corners and take advantage of the long gearing, it was a world beater. But it was one of those motorcycles that took a special breed of rider to get the most out of it. Next, in 1967, we have the Triumph T100 Daytona. Buddy Elmore had taken the works Triumph Tiger to victory in Daytona in 1966. And never a company to miss an opportunity, Triumph developed an all-new high-performance Tiger to try and help it carve out a piece of the huge American market. So, the Tiger T100 Daytona was born. It produced 41 horsepower and 38 newton meters of torque and weighed in at just 160 kilos. This meant it could hit the top speed of 105 miles an hour. It did it relatively cheaply too. This was one of the motorcycles that dragged the aging Triumph Speed Twin into the firefight that was the 60s quest for more speed. The mass-produced Triumphs just didn't have the same price tag as hand-built Velocets. They were easier to live with than the highly tuned big singles too. Looking back, the Daytona has a timeless design that is still being copied today. It doesn't look at all dated when compared to many modern bikes, and when compared to the bikes of its day, it was treading fresh new ground. In 1968, a new contender hit the market. Two-stroke power had begun to dominate racing and the Japanese were bringing it to market. Suzuki had the benefit of all the parts and plans that had been stolen from MZ by Ernst Degner, and in 1968, they unveiled the all-new Suzuki T500 Titan, 
an air-cooled vertical twin cylinder two-stroke that would again change the focus of the industry. The T500 produced around 45 horsepower and about 50 newton meters of torque. It weighed 185 kilos, but still had a top speed of 115 miles an hour straight out of the showroom. Compared to the Daytona, or indeed most bikes of the time, this was a seriously fast motorcycle. The engine formed the base for many race bike builds, and it was the forerunner of all the great GT range of two-stroke Suzuki's that would follow. The torque of the original engine put all of the other bikes on the market to shame. There really was nothing that could compete. It was simple to work on and tune too. Less parts also meant cheaper manufacturing, so even with the import tariffs, it was a cheap and well-built motorcycle that began to solidify Suzuki's place in the market. Next, we have a motorcycle that you will all recognise. As much as the T500 had begun to reshape the industry, this motorcycle would smash all the moulds. It was the Kawasaki H1 Mach 3, a 500cc two-stroke triple designed to be the fastest motorcycle on the market. As you all told me, this motorcycle should have probably featured in the Dangerous Motorcycles video, which I would link above. Kawasaki knew that Honda had something big coming. They almost certainly knew some of the details of the CB750 project. They had their own big four-stroke in the pipeline, but the Z900 wasn't going to be ready. In the background, a project had been planned, and they'd been experimenting with inline and L triples. They decided on an inline three-cylinder two-stroke, and were determined to make it the most powerful production bike available to steal Honda's thunder. As such, shortly after the release of the CB750, the first Kawasaki H1 Mach 3 rolled into dealerships. The CB750 was big, powerful, comfortable and refined. The Kawasaki was only one of those things. It was built for one purpose. Speed. It quickly established itself as the top dog when it came to speed. The engine produced around 60 horsepower standard and the torque was around 55 newton meters. So it was significantly more powerful than the T500. But all the power was produced in a really narrow rev range that meant the throttle had only two settings, all or nothing. The design had been thrown together in a total of just 14 months, which meant very little research and no development had been done other than the engine. The chassis was poor, the suspension had the stiffness of cooked spaghetti, and the brakes might have well have not existed. But customers didn't care. They wanted the power. Whatever the consequences were, whatever drawbacks the final motorcycle had, with a weight of just 175 kilos dry, the monster of an engine could propel this motorcycle to the end of a quarter mile strip in just 12 seconds and could take it up to a claimed top speed of 124 miles an hour. Just a note here, the Honda CB750 had a claimed top speed of 123.6 miles an hour. So the 124 mile an hour claimed speed of the Kawasaki was very convenient. The reality is, both were fairly hopeful for a showroom buy, but the two stroke tuners would make sure that the H1 was always first in the queue at the drag strip. The bike was raw, noisy, smelly, uneconomical and dangerous to ride, and customers loved them. With the possible exception of the AJS Porcupine, this was the fastest 500cc motorcycle ever put into production. It would retain that title right through the 1970s and much of the 1980s. From the ridiculous to the sublime, in 1971, Honda released the CB504. As its name suggests, it was the smaller across the frame 4 that Honda had built to complement the success 
of the CB750. CB500 wasn't quite as powerful as its big brother, producing 50 horsepower and 45 newton meters of torque. But at 200 kilos, it was almost 25 kilograms or 50 pounds lighter. It had the comfortable refinement of the CB750, but it handled better, was more flickable, and had a creditable top speed of around 115 miles an hour. It might not have been an H1, but it was the fastest four-stroke 500cc motorcycle of its day, and the single cam engine was a delight to ride and totally indestructible. To put into perspective how good this motorcycle was, in 1973 it was entered into the 500cc production class at the Isle of Man TT, and it won. Bill Smith was the rider who bought it home first, over 8 seconds ahead of the great Stan Waters on a Suzuki T500. I guess Kawasaki didn't get the memo. 1973 saw Yamaha fight back with an all new 4 stroke parallel twin. The double overhead cam Yamaha TX500 producing 48 horsepower and 44 newton meters of torque. It was almost a match for the Honda 4, but even with a lighter weight of 195 kilos, it just never managed to better the Honda. With a top speed of around 110 miles an hour, it certainly couldn't match the T500 and H1. Despite that, it was a great buy, and formed the soul of the iconic XS650 that followed soon afterwards. Yet somehow, it seems to be overlooked and overshadowed by the later 650 that may never have existed without the TX500. Three more years passed with nothing significant coming to the market to challenge the H1 as the fastest two-stroke 500, or the CB500 as the fastest four-stroke of the 70s. Yes, I know I've already told you the Velocet Venom Thruxter and the AGSE 90 were faster, but for now, I'm using the CB500 as the new benchmark for the 70s. Then, in 1976, we had three new and very different contenders. The first was the smallest, the least powerful, and it wasn't as fast as the H1 or the T500 either. So what made it so great you felt you had to include it, I hear you say? Well, two simple letters should explain that. It was an RD. The new Yamaha RD400 produced around 44 horsepower and about 40 newton meters of torque, but it weighed just 165 kilos dry. 35 kilos or over 75 pounds less than either the TX500 or the CB504. Top speed of the RD400 was no more impressive, with about 108 mile an hour standard. So again, it wasn't a winner in that department but it handled really well, and the lighter weight made it a fantastic package and exciting to ride. Wheelies had never been so easy. Whatever it was that all the early RDs had, the RD400 had it by the bucket load. Stood in a crowd of bigger, more expensive bikes, it was still the RDs that got the biggest audience. They had their haters for sure, but many more people loved them. Specialist tuning shops could make them faster too, and it was a lot easier to make the RD400 faster than it was to make the bigger, heavier bikes lighter. These things together meant that in the right hands, the RD could often have the edge in the real world, whatever bikes were chasing. The RD400 was a real giant killer, in a way few bikes have managed to be over the years. The Kajiva Mito is probably next on that particular list, so the RD is already in fabled company, but that is, as they say, a story for another day. The next motorcycle that landed in 1976 was the Ducati 500 Sport Desmo, and this is one of those motorcycles that really does split opinions. 
is split opinions in the factory too. Half of the staff at Ducati never wanted to build it, as they'd become known for their big V-twin bevel drive engines used in the 900SS and the 860 GTE. The 500 Sport Desmo was to be a parallel twin, and despite having never made a parallel twin before, Ducati built a great motorcycle. It was as powerful as the Honda 4, but it was lighter too. It produced 50 horsepower and around 42 newton meters of torque, but the twin weighed less than the Honda at 185 kilos. Top speed was around the same 115 mile an hour mark, but the Ducati pulled better with a consistently better quarter mile time. However, it had another Italian to contend with that was following in its footsteps. That motorcycle was the Benelli 500 Quattro. Benelli had very definitely not purchased the Honda CB500 for and then deconstructed it when designing the 750 Save. They said so. The 500 Quattro was effectively two thirds of the 750 Save's cylinder engine, but was almost identical to the Honda engine. It was smooth and powerful, and a rival for the Honda at everything except what Hondas do best, consistent reliability. The Benelli 500 Quattro produced around the same 50 horsepower as the CB500, and had a claimed torque figure of just over 40 newton meters, and a similar weight to the Ducati at 185 kilos. From that, they claimed a top speed of 118 miles an hour, which was slightly faster than both the Honda and the Ducati, at least according to the manufacturers it was. Remember, this was a motorcycle built when the Italian industry was fighting for survival, and despite the genuine quality of the build in general, there were inconsistencies and reliability issues. Jumping three years again, we come to 1979, I guess things run in three year cycles then. This brings me to the last motorcycle on the list proper today, although there is one more honourable mention. I will look at the 500cc bikes of the 80s and 90s in a future video. This motorcycle was fast, Italian and the last roll of the dice for the company concerned. The Italian economy was dying and taking the motorcycle industry with it. The 500 Sport Desmo wasn't the sales success Ducati had hoped for, and they needed a mid-sized motorcycle they could offer at a good price. Shrinking down the by then legendary 900 SS engine should always have been the obvious choice. When they did, the motorcycle that was released was the Ducati 500 SL Panther. This mock the direction that Fabio Taglioni would take the next generation of Ducati engines in, and it's influenced every Ducati engine built since. They kept the now ubiquitous Desmo valve actuators, but replaced the bevel drive cams with a toothed belt drive. It wasn't the sort of minimal sports bike Ducati had been famous for either. This was a more refined ride. The trellis frame handled beautifully, and the smooth engine made it a pleasure to ride when compared to the more common parallel twins of the time. Power wasn't electrifying at just 45 horsepower, but it was the low down grunt and delectable soundtrack that always made this bike seem fast. The official torque figure was 45 newton meters, and the bike weighed around 180 kilos dry but Ducati claimed a top speed of 121 mile an hour, making it, in theory, the second fastest 500cc motorcycle on the market after the Kawasaki H1. I'm not sure how accurate that figure was, as we know that the factories always stretch the truth, but it was a capable GT bike, despite being just 500cc, and it was no slouch. Finally, I'm going to give one more motorcycle an honorary mention. I featured the Liberta 500 Montjuic in another video, which should be linked above, so I won't include it here. It wasn't the fastest of the 500s, 
but producing around 58 horsepower in standard trim, it was a four-stroke twin that was almost as powerful as the Kawasaki H1 triple. The engine would be developed even further, eventually reaching 750cc almost three decades later, which should give you an idea how over-engineered the original design really was. If you're interested, there's some footage of me taking one of the Laverdas with the later incarnation of this engine around Cadwall Park in the video linked above. So, where does this leave us in the title for the fastest 500cc bikes then? If we purely use speed, we actually end up with the AJS E90 Porcupine at number one, with a top speed of 135 miles an hour. And number two, we have the Kawasaki H1 Mach 3 at 124 miles an hour. And number three, we have the Ducati 650SL Panther at 121 miles an hour. At four, we have the Benelli 500 Quattro at 118 miles an hour. And we have three bikes tied for fifth place at 115 miles an hour. The Ducati 500 Sport Desmo the Honda CB500 4 and the Suzuki T500 Titan. However, if we look at power, we get a slightly different list. First, we have the Kawasaki H1 at 60 horsepower. Second, we have the Laverda Montjuic at 58 horsepower. Equal third at 55 horsepower, we have the AJS E95 Porcupine and the Benelli Quattro. And equal fifth at 50 horsepower, we have the Honda CB504 and the Ducati 500 Desmo Sport. Personally, I would probably put my list closer to the second power based list. What would your top five be? Well, that's it for today. If you got this far, I take it you've endured this trip into the fiery and flamboyant history of the 500cc motorcycle. I have to say, it's been a very interesting video to make. Some of the bikes as usual surprised me, so I hope you got a surprise or two as well. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It only takes you a few seconds and it does help me, because YouTube is forced to push the content out to more and more people. It really does help to get the word out to those people who don't know about the channel yet. Subscribing also means you get to find out first when our regular updates, news, views and other videos go out each week. Don't forget to share the video with anyone you think will be interested too if you would. You can visit the website or the Red Bull shop linked in the description for the best biker t-shirts and other merchandise. And there's a contact page on the website if you need to get in touch too. There are more exciting motorcycle adventures and other stories from the shed and beyond on the website. So why not grab a cuppa and take a look around? You won't be disappointed. Thanks for watching. I hope you get some great riding in. Ride free everyone.